Well, I titled the message this morning from Luke 21 here, Always Be Ready. Always Be Ready. And you know, being ready, that's an interesting, interesting subject. Right? That can be a lot of things to a lot of different people. Right? Anybody married here? <laughs> you think, uh-oh, where's he going with this, you know? It can be different for men and women, right? You find that out when you're married sometimes, right? It's, uh, you know, hey, you ready? Yeah. You know, and I don't know how it is in your house, you know what I mean? You know, I kind of be standing there, you know, shoes on and everything, and you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Well, how come you're not down here, you know? Like, that means let's go out the door, but we got different definitions sometimes of those things. I'm still learning about this, you know, that that, that happens in, in life and in marriage, right? If you have kids, hey, who has kids here? Some, some of you got kids here, right? Being ready, right? That's, that's an interesting thing when kids come along. I remember before we had kids, you're like, man, what's the matter? My sister, she had all these kids. You're like, why are they so late all the time? You know, like, what's their problem? How come they're not, you know, and you, you look at it, you get kids, you know, and, and it's like now we've, we've got five, you know, and you're, you're grabbing one under your arm here. You got a bucket here, you know, throwing another one over your shoulder, just dragging them to the car, you know, and, and you, just, you got a checklist. Do we have diapers? Do we have this? You know, I was playing Mr. Mom last week for a couple of days, and I'm thinking, man, you know, getting everybody out there, and you get somewhere, and all of a sudden you realize somebody doesn't have pants on, you know, like, you don't got shoes, and you're like, oh, Lord, you know, don't tell Kate, but uh, no, that didn't happen, I'm just kidding, it, it, it has, though, you know what I mean, you're like, well, how did, how did we leave, and how did not, I don't know, I thought he had it, it it's, you know, and all those things go on, being ready, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing, you know, and I was talking with a couple this weekend, that uh, they were in the mission field and, and in the country they were in, they were telling me that they went and he, were doing, he was a pastor and he's doing a wedding and, uh, and when he's over there and they, they were living there that it was cultural in that time, in, in, in that place, it's cultural for the bride to be late to the wedding, like three hours late. Everybody, everybody's there and they go it was our, the first wedding he did and we're sitting there he's telling me and it's like three hours and they had got, gotten babysitters for their kids and stuff you know they're like man what's going on but it's, it's like a badge of honor like yeah I was three hours late you know for my wedding and I was like man that's crazy you know it can be cult, cultural things you know, but there's certain things in life we want to be ready for I, I remember you know I, I kind of at you know, different times I've, I've traveled overseas and you know done mission works and things like that. So I've always, always kept my passport up to date. I want to be ready. You know, all right, you know, door opens up, something happens. And, you know, last year I got a call. Hey, hey, we, we need you to come and, and go with this group over to Israel. And I was glad I was ready. You know, glad I had that passport. No way I could have got it in time. You know, there's certain things in life you can't do unless you're prepared, unless you're ready. And, you know, I was, I was just thinking about that here because in Luke 21, Jesus is exhorting. Jesus has been speaking to his disciples ultimately about being ready right Be, being ready you know he's is a, it's the last days of his life and his ministry here on earth he's talking to them about the end of the age he's talking to them about the second coming he's exhorting them he wants them to be prepared doesn't want to be surprised by what's happening in, in their own lives and what's going to happen in the future and what's going to come upon this earth and he's speaking to them and, and he said when these things begin to happen remember last week look up lift your head up Right? Your, your redemption draws nigh. Hey, you know, we're, we're looking around this world, and man, we know it's close. You see all these signs happening, and, and you know, I gave that example last week. You see all the Christmas decorations, what do you know? Thanksgiving's about to happen, right? It's, it's right around the corner. Sometimes it's in July. You could be like, yeah, 4th of July is going to happen. And you go to, I remember going to Sam's Club a year or two ago, and it was like the middle of the summer, and they got like the trees and Christmas stuff there. I'm like, man, they are ready early this year, you know. But you know how that is. And so we see that things are, are, are being set up. They're lining up for, for what's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. When we know before that, hey, our redemption draws nigh. We're going to be raptured and caught up to be with the Lord. And so Jesus wants the disciples to, to get their heads up, not be looking at this world, living at this world, but, but to have their hearts set on heaven, to have their, you know, their, their lives with that right perspective because that's going to affect and impact the way that we live in this world right now, right now. We see all these things. And he said, look up. Because, you know, Jesus, he's, he's been preparing a place for us, and he's been preparing us for that place. But guess what? The wedding bells are going to ring. 
Guess what? We're going to be with him and Jesus is coming for his bride. And now what happens here, this, this exhortation that Jesus gives, there, there's also a, a warning. You know, we, we read these last, last number of verses here in, in Luke chapter 21 and Jesus is talking about, man, take heed to yourself and he's warning against these different things that we'll look out here. And, and Jesus didn't just say this because, man, we need a couple extra verses just fluff out this chapter here. You know, it's going to be out of balance with chapter 22. That's going to have a lot, you know. You ever look at 22 yet? 71 verses in there. And you're like, man, we got to just kind of balance. That's not, that's not how it happened. Right? Jesus, he wasn't wasting his words here. He was warning the church, warning the disciples, warning the believers about these things because it's a real danger to your life and mine. It's a real thing that we need to be on guard about, to be aware of. So he's warning them. He's warning us. And so it's important to us. We want to look at it here. Jesus, he says in verse 34, he said, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and, and cares of this life, and, and so that that day come upon you unawares. Take heed. Take heed. It means watch out. Watch out. Be careful. Be careful about these things. You know, this, this, this phrase, this word that he's using right here, if you do a study on it, it's in the present imperative. I'm still learning the English language, so I got to look these things up, right? You know, my wife, she taught second grade for years, and she's like, you know, maybe you need to do second grade again, you know? But, but the great thing is we can study and we can, can learn these things. What does that mean? It's in the present imperative. Well, it, it's, it's an imperative. That means it's a, it's a command. This isn't, he's not suggesting, you know, you, you really should take heed about it. It might be a really great idea. My opinion on this is that this might be a great thing. It's, it's a command. He's saying, here's something you must do. Here's something you got to do. He's, he's commanding us as his disciples, hey, take heed. Beware, right? This, this is what you need to do. And it's also in the present tense. And, and, and the idea is that you need to constantly do this. It's present imperative. You need to constantly be taking heed to yourselves, right? Take heed to yourselves, to you, to your life. You need to have this vigilance, this constant awareness in your life about the things that he's going to talk about here. This is important. He said, don't let up on it. You don't want to get lazy about what he's talking about. And he says, it. He says, all right, take heed all right, to yourselves. I don't want to be lazy about this, man. We need to be diligent all the time. But why? Lest you, any time your heart be, be overcharged. So he's warning us. You need to pay attention. There, there, there's something that you need to be aware of because if you're not, it's going to affect your heart. And your heart's going to be, be overcharged. And he's, he's, he's concerned about our heart. He's not talking about the physical pumper here. You've got to pay attention. Saying, you know, right, you know, people, you've got to pay attention to this. Diet, exercise, you know. got to eat the right way. Take care of the blood pressure. That's not what he's talking about. He's, he's not, I mean, I'm certain he's concerned about our physical health and well-being and all of those things like that. But, but there's something. He's talking about the spiritual heart, isn't he? He's talking about, about the, the seed of our emotions, Right? He's, he's speaking about, about our hearts here. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23, it says, Guard your heart. Keep your heart. Guard it. Because out of it flow all the issues of life. There's something important about, about, our, about our hearts, the issues of life. You know, all, all the issues that we face, they're heart issues. It's from the heart that these things come out, Jesus would say. And so Jesus gets to the heart. He doesn't want your heart to be, to be overcharged. To be overcharged. You say, what does that mean, to be, to be overcharged? What's well, interesting, this is the only place in the New Testament that this word for overcharged is used right here. And, and what it means, what it means is to be, to be weighed down or to be dulled. That there's things that can happen in this life and in this world that can, that can dull your heart. There's things that can weigh your heart down. Things that can, can burden you. And he's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. Take heed. You got you to constantly be aware, be vigilant about your heart. Because if you're, not, if you're not aware of these things, if you're not being diligent, then there's things that can, can weigh you down. There's things that can, can dull your heart. Yeah, you, you know it just as well as I do. It doesn't take much for your heart to get dull, does it? It doesn't take much for your heart to get weighed down and to, to be burdened. 
So Jesus is saying, you gotta, you gotta take heed. You gotta, you gotta be continually on guard over your life and the things you do and the things you, that you're involved in. Because if you're not, if you're not vigilant about these, your heart's gonna get dull. It's, it's going to be weighed down. It's gonna grow hard and grow insensitive to, to the Lord and to the working of His Holy Spirit in your life. That can happen. You know, I said the only place in the New Testament this word is used is right here in Luke chapter uh, 21. That, that your heart can be dull, that can be weighed down, overcharged right here is, is the word in the King James. But did you know in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the Septuagint, they use this word in one place also. And it's in Exodus chapter 7, speaking about the hardness of the heart of Pharaoh, that his heart was hardened. Right? That's, that, that, that's the idea here, right? Pharaoh's heart. Remember when Pharaoh hardened his heart and said that, you know, here, here comes Moses. And Moses, what, what's he doing? He's saying, hey, let my people go. And, and, and God, you know, is, is doing these signs and doing these miracles. He's speaking to, to Pharaoh. He goes, hey, you need to wake up, right? He turns the Nile to blood. I mean, these plagues and these judgments, man, there's frogs coming out the sheets. Anybody ever have a frog in your sheets before? I, I didn't expect any hands to go up right there. I remember one time, I never had a frog in my sheets, but when, when my brother was born, I got booted down to the basement. And, uh, and so, so dad built, my dad built a room in the basement down there. And you know basements, they're just like filled with all sorts of creepy, crawly things. I remember, I remember I'm sleeping there, and you're, you're just about to be asleep, but you're kind of awake. I, I just saw Rachel like cringe already over there. You don't even know what I'm going to say, you know? And, and I'm laying there and up my leg, I feel this like, I, I scream like, ah, you know, jump, throw the covers back. I'm going like this. And it was one of those like big house centipedes, you know, the big hairy growth. Oh man. I'm like, ah, ah, you know, I'm, I'm going to get this thing, grabbed a blanket, slept on the couch for like a week. You know what I mean? Like I'm just like, I am not going back. And then anytime after, you know, you're just like looking around like, oh man. I'd repent if that was the judgment of the Lord, you know, like, and here Pharaoh, what's Pharaoh, there's a point to that. <laughs> Pharaoh hardened his heart. You know, he's got frogs in the sheets, waters be turned into blood, all of these, these judgments are coming and he hardens his heart and he hardens his heart to the Lord. He just continues, he's desensitized to it all. And, and what's crazy is those judgments, they were intended to produce a response. God, God is reaching out. God wants him to respond. God wants him to, 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 to take action in a certain way, and he's not doing that. Even though the judgment of God is coming and all of these things are happening and all of these warnings, right? And, and here, Jesus, as he's speaking to his disciples, he's speaking about the end of the age, the second coming, about the judgment that's coming upon this earth. He says, you gotta watch your heart. Don't, don't become insensitive to the judgment of God that's coming upon this earth. You see all these things going on and you're living in this world and your heart can become dull, it can be hardened, it can be desensitized to the point where we see the judgment of God and these things happening around us and we see, man, things are lining up and we can just be dull to it. We should be numb to what's happening around us. Take heed to yourselves. And, 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 and you know he's talking to Christians, right? He's talking, isn't to talking to the world right here. He's talking to the Christians. And, and, and you know, the, the part I mentioned it earlier, the, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, one of the things the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, right, he convinces of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You know, before we're saved, there's that, that, that alongside work of the Holy Spirit convicting you of what's wrong and what's right and the judgment to come. But that doesn't stop, does it? Right now, now the, he, he's in you and he wants to be upon your life and the Holy Spirit wants to continue to search us, continue to, to try us, continue to work in our life and, and he, he convicts us of things that, that aren't right, of sin. He convicts us and hey man, this is wrong, this is right and hey, there, there's judgment, there's accountability for these things and, and, and but what can happen is we can kind of, our hearts, they can become dull, they can be uns, insensitive, they can be hardened, where the Holy Spirit speaking and we say no, and the Holy Spirit speaks and we say no, and the Holy Spirit speaks and we harden our heart, and what happens is it becomes harder and harder to hear the voice of the Lord, and you become dull, and you become insensitive to the work that God desires to do in your life. And, and how does that happen? How do you get to that point? How does your heart become dull? Well, look at what Jesus says here. Less than any times your hearts be overcharged, 
Look what he says. With surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. What's surfeiting? That's not surfing. That's not, not surfeiting. That's a different word, right? It's not warning us against surfeiting. One, one, of the, uh, one, one of the books I was reading on the, the language and the studies of this, they describe it literally as, as a hangover. Yeah, your Bible might say dissipation, the descent into drunkenness, the, the overconsumption. The idea is there, it's the excessive indulgence of the flesh. This excessive indulgence, that's, that's what a hangover comes from, right? An excessive indulgence in alcohol, right? That's how, how people become hungover, right? And, and you can have this excessive indulgence in the flesh in your life, and it's, it's going to produce a hangover. And, you know, that's not limited to alcohol, right? People, you know, excessively indulge in that, right? You get a certain age, you have too much sugar, right? And you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't do this, you know? <laughs> you, you eat the pot. Anybody have all the pasta last week, you know? And you go home after, and you're just like, I'm going to crash. You know, like, what's going on? You, you can't handle all the, the carbs and all those things anymore. But, you know, you can, you, you stay up too late, right? You're up, man, I'm up past midnight. Next day, you're like, walking into work. Oh, what's going on? You know, hey, what happened? I was up past midnight, you know? What are you doing? Playing video games all night. You know, it's like, it can be an excessive indulgence in the flesh, right? That can produce something in our lives. And so he's, he's warning us here. He's warning us that that can make you dull, right? When, when you indulge, right, in, 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 the, in the desires of the flesh. You know what the Bible says in Galatians 5, 24? Those that are Christ, they've crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts thereof. Your Bible might say the passions and the desires, right? You've got these passions. You've got these desires, these things. And, and you know, we live in a world that says, hey, if it feels good, do it. You know, I, I, I am this way, right? And, and we say, no, th this is my identity. This is who I am. And I'm just a person that, that, that's into these kind of things. I, I'm this kind of guy or this kind of girl or I'm into this kind of stuff. And, and, and you, you, those are your passions. Those are your desires. And that, that's just what I'm going to give unto. But, but th there's ungodly passions and ungodly desires that we can have. The, the things, the appetites of our flesh. And the Bible says you don't give into and you don't have to give into it. Amen. How awesome is that? that? That there's victory in Christ Jesus. And he says, we crucify. We bring it to the cross. We bring it to Jesus. And he says, you don't want to live just to satisfy your affections and your desires. In, in, in Romans chapter 8, it, it talks about it being carnally minded. Right? When, when we're carnally minded, he says it's death. Right? We want to be spiritually minded. That, that produces life. But to be carnally minded, Romans chapter 8, it, it's, it's death. It's death. It's going to dull your heart. He says here, beware, take heed about these things, about this overindulgence in the flesh and, and drunkenness. You know what drunkenness is. I'm sure pretty much everybody here is, you know, I've got to explain what that is, right? But you know who he's warning here? They're not warning the world. Hey, world, shame, shame, shame. Everybody knows your name, you know. He's warning the church. He's saying drunkenness. This, this is an issue right here, right? It's just a warning to the believers. You know, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, it says that they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink. When you read strong drink, that means beer. Now your Bible might even, some of the Bibles translate it that way. They've erred through wine, through strong drink. They've gone out of the way. The priest and the prophet, they've erred through strong drink. They've swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They've erred in vision. They stumble in judgment. That's what it does, right? Strong drink, wine. He's talking about this here. He's saying what, what can happen is that these things in your life, man, all of a sudden, it don't, you don't have the judgment you ought to have, right? You're, you're going to err in judgment. You're going to go out of the way. That's the effect. And he's saying this dulls the heart. It's gonna, you're going to make bad choices and wrong decisions. I don't think anybody that knows or has experienced drunkenness, you know, would argue with that. Bad decisions that you make. 
Not hearing the Lord speak, not being convicted, it can harden our heart. It can dull our senses. What he's talking about here is in a spiritual sense. Here's things that, that we can do in our life that are going to dull our senses to what the Lord desires to do. And then he says here, the cares of this life. The cares of this life. That, that, that can hinder your spiritual growth. It, it, can, it can, can make you fruitless. Remember in, in Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, when Jesus gave the parable about the sower and he went out into the field and he sowed the seed and some landed on the stony ground, some landed, you know, among the thorns, right? Some, you know, it was, it was good soil, some the birds of the field. And you got that whole parable there. But remember what he said about those that, that, that fell among the thorns? They were those that heard the word of God and, and, and it began to, to, to shoot up, but it was choked out by the cares of this life. That's what the thorns were. It was the cares of this life. And what happened, it didn't produce any fruit. There was, no, there was no fruit from it that came. The riches, the pleasures of this life, it choked out the word and there was no fruit. And what happens is the cares of this life, they can choke you out. The cares, the, the riches, the pleasures of this life, it can hinder the word of God from taking root in your heart and producing fruit. And he's saying this can dull your heart. This can cause you to be weighed down. You're not responding the way you should to the conviction of the Lord. You know, this world, in John uh, chapter 2, verse 15, I don't know if I put a bookmark there or not, but it's not hard to find. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's not of the Father, but it's of the world. The world, it passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This world is passing away. This world, it's, it's not our home right? The Bible speaks of us as believers, as pilgrims, as, as sojourners, right? We're, we're on a journey. We don't have a home in this world. This, this isn't where we belong. We're, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Our heart is set on heaven. He's saying this world, it's going. The passions, the things you live for, it's not going to be here. But there are things that are eternal. There are things that are going to last. And what he's warning is, take heed. You need to watch out. You don't want to be living for this world, Right? You don't want to be like this world. And when we indulge in the flesh, and, and you know, what, what, all these things here, you indulge in the flesh, the drunkenness, the, you know, the, the living for this world, what happens is in a spiritual sense, it dulls the heart. In the spiritual sense, it, it weighs you down. Right? You become insensitive to the, to the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I was thinking about it, just reading through, meditating on that, and there, there was somebody that came to mind. And you're like, oh no, I hope it wasn't me. No, not you. Somebody in the Bible. <laughs> right? Somebody in the Bible. And, 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 I, and, I, and I turned over to, to 2 Peter. And I, I was thinking about Lot. Remember Lot? You know, God's judging Sodom and Gomorrah. And Peter talks about that. You know, the judgment that came. And, and those that live ungodly. But it says in, in 2 Peter 2, 7 that, that, that God delivered just Lot not Lot alone, but that speaking about that he was just. Who, but it says Lot, and he says, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. There's a contrast, but he gives us his insight into, into Lot, right? It says that he was vexed, and, and there's actually two different words that are being used there. You know, the first time he, he's vexed, it's, it's weighing him down, right? This is the idea, man. The, the, the filthy conversation, the things going around him, it, but, but it says there when it says in, in verse 8, he's a righteous man, he's dwelling among them, but the seeing and the hearing, it vexed, it tormented is the idea there. His righteous soul from day to day, their unlawful deeds, seeing, hearing, look, all the wickedness around him, it just, it just tormented him. It weighed him down. It burdened him down. And I, you know, this world, you know what that tells me? This world can have an impact on you in not a good way. Did you know that? You know, sometimes we think, God, oh, that's not going to affect me. You know, I can, I, can, I can go there. I can do that. 
I, I can watch those things. I can be around this. I, I can handle it. That, that was a lot, right? But what's going to happen is going to weigh you down. That's going to torment you because we don't belong. That's, that's the problem with Lot, right? That's the problem when, when, when we live like that is that you don't belong in this world, right? And you're trying to and you're getting right buddy up to this world, but it just, it, it, it weighs you down and you get, you get convicted and then you feel condemned from the enemy and, and God wants to do a work and all these things. And what happened? You know, he moved his tent. You know, I was, I was reading, I turned back to Genesis and was reading about Lot. Remember there was strife between him and Abraham. And Abraham's just like, man, whatever you want, you, you take it. You go that way, I'll go the other way. And, and he looked at the, at the plain of Sodom there the, before God's judgment was beautiful like Eden, it says. And, and, he, and he, that's where he moved. That's where he set up his tent. Even, and it says, even up to Sodom. Right there next to it. Brings his family there. It's not just Lot. Man, it, 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 it infected his, his whole family. And then the next time we see Lot, he's getting carried away. That you know they're getting attacked, and Abraham comes to his rescue, and he still doesn't realize, man, it's a bad idea to be in Sodom. Then the next time we read about him, he's sitting in the gate of the city. God warned; he was oblivious to the judgment that was coming. He didn't even know, but God knows how to deliver the righteous. Praise, praise the Lord for that. Even Lot live in carnality, live in there in the world. God still loves him. God still rescues him. But there he is, man. He's involved with the government. Man, he's on the, the school board and the city council, right? And, and, and then he, he look, you look at his family, and they don't even want to come with him. And they're, they, they just, they're, they're, it, it affects them too. You think you're compromised. You think you're sin. You think it's only going to affect you. It's going to impact everybody around you, right? And there was no fear. It's interesting. There was no fear of the judgment that was coming, right? Oh, no, no, no. Right, and, and they're like, the angels were like, dude. I don't, they didn't say dude. That's my translation, right? Don't look back for dude in the Bible. It's not there, right? But... <laughs> They're like, dude, we got to go. We got to get out of here, right? And they're, they're like, and, but there was no fear. There's no fear of God. There was no fear of the judgment of God. There was no fear of the wrath coming. Because, man, he's just, he's just right in there with it. And, and, and this is a real warning because Jesus knows what this world can do to our hearts. He knows what happens when we're not diligent, when we're not watching, when we're not ready, right? When, when we engage in sin, when we indulge in the f flesh. And so Jesus said, you need to be vigilant. You need to be constantly aware of these things. Later, Paul would pick up on this in the book of Romans chapter 13. He says, knowing the time, Time, right? We know the time. We're watching around us, right? We've been talking about earthquakes in diverse places and signs in the heavens and all these things. Man, anybody see the volcanoes, you know? Like, man, this is crazy what's going on. Yeah, you look at what's happening in, in, in Iran. You see what's happening in Syria with Russia. And you're just, you're just watching. You're like, man, this is, this is setting up. This is getting into place. All of these things are happening. We know the time. And he says here, because we know the time, it's time to wake up out of our sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the armor of light. We'll walk on. Honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness and chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fill the lust thereof. And we know the time. At times almost up. It's almost daybreak. So he says, let's cast off. Because we know it's time. The, the, the day's at hand. Jesus is coming. Let, let's get rid of, of the works of darkness. You know what the works of darkness are? You know what that is, the works of darkness? That's the things you do that you don't want anybody else to know. That's the works of darkness. The things in your life, you don't want anybody else to know about those things. The things that are, are done in the dark, right? Things that you keep in the secret. And you know what he says here? Cast it off. Cast it off. You've got to get rid of those things out of your life. Get rid of the, the works of darknesses and put on the armor of light and walk honestly in the day. And he's talking to the church. 
He's saying, man, there's things in your life that are works of darkness. There's things in your life maybe you don't want anybody else to know about. You don't know anybody else to find out about. He says, you need to get rid of that out of your life and you need to walk honestly as in the day. You need to walk in the light. You know, we're told in John, it says, walk in the light as he is in the light, right? And we have fellowship with the Father and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. God can cleanse you. God can set you free. Maybe there's things in your life that are works of darkness, things in your life you don't want anybody else to know about. Man, I'm struggling with this. I'm going through this. He says, hey, you come. You walk honestly. You be honest with the Lord. You confess your sin. You walk in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Jesus cleanses you. And guess what? You got fellowship with the Father because you don't have fellowship in darkness. That's no fun. I've been there. You've been there. Or living in rebellion against the Lord and there's, there's not the communion, there's not the closeness, there's not the nearness. God wants you close to him. God wants to cleanse you. God wants to set you free, right? Let's walk honestly in the day. Get rid of it. Get it out of your life. You know, we're, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so he gives this list. It's not by no means an exhaustive list in Romans 13, right? But he says, you know, we're going to walk in the day. And here's what he says is not. Here, here's what's not walking in the light. Here, it's rioting and drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, strife, and anger envying, right? Uh, right uh, you know, it says there, uh, uh, riotous partying, drunkenness. Must have been a problem in the first century. I think partying and drunkenness is a problem in the 21st century, right? I remember I was over in England, you know, and, and, and when I was there, and, oh, this is just a cultural thing. And I was there, and we, we were watching the news, and, and they didn't know what to do because of the partying and the drunkenness that was happening in the city that we lived in. They, they, they were, it was on the news, made the news, right, because of the, the rioting and the drunkenness and people in the streets, all the things. This was a problem. When there's a cult, listen, sin's not a cultural thing. Sin's a people thing, Right? That's what, that's what he's chambering and wantonness. Chambering. You know what chambering is? You know, the Bible calls the bedroom the bed chamber, right? Chambering, that's sleeping with someone that's not your husband or wife. That's what that is. That, it, it, it's, it's sexual immorality, somebody you're not married to. Wantonness is just the absence of moral restraint, lewdness, your Bible might say. Strife and envy, fighting, arguing, envy. You know, just being, uh, resenting people because of what they have. And strife and envy go together. Because that's not, that's not walking in the light. Those things shouldn't define the life of the believer of the, or the Christian. You know, First Peter chapter 4, verse 3. Remember Peter says, you know, I've already spent, I've already spent enough time in the past doing those things. And, and you know that. And we're not going to have to raise any hands here. But how many, you wasted enough of your life being wasted? <laughs> You wasted enough of your life on all those things that Paul's talking there. And now you come to Christ. He's saying, let's not, we already spent enough time doing that. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. You, you put off those things and now you put on Jesus. You put off those things and now you put on Jesus. And don't make any provision. Don't, don't give the opportunity. Don't, don't plan. All right, how am I going to do this? He says, don't, don't do that anymore. You put on Jesus. You follow him. And, and so back in, in Luke chapter 21, you know, take heed to yourselves. All of these things, you know, uh, surfeiting, drunkenness, the cares of this life. He says, look at this. So that, that day, that day come upon you unaware, suddenly, unexpectedly. You know, the, the rapture of the church that's what he's talking about. The rapture of the church, that's not supposed to surprise the believer, right? We're not going to be like, whoa, right? We're, we're, to be, we're looking around and Jesus is saying, you look up, you be ready, get your eyes off this world, you see this, it's coming. But these things will dull your heart in such a way, man, it could be a surprise to you. He's saying, don't, don't be living a life of sin when Jesus comes for his church. I don't want to be living that way. You know, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, you know, it talks about this earth world passing away and all these things. He says, but we, 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 according to his promise, we look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, because that's what we're looking for, because this world's passing away, he says, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, 
be diligent that you might be found in him in peace without spot or blemish. All right, there should be an urgency of our life. I, I, wanna, I wanna be on guard about my heart. I wanna be on guard about my life. I wanna be found of him without spot or blameless. I wanna be a pure and a holy bride. It says in 1 John 2, verse 28, you could have just stayed in chapter 2 earlier. We were already there. But in verse 28, 1 John 2, it says, and now little children abide in him. I like that. Stay close to Jesus. You know, Jesus is, is the vine and we're the branches. And, and we know that in John 15, man, we need to abide. We need to be connected to Christ. He says, abide in him. And, and here's why. Here's what's going to happen. That when he shall appear, that's what we're waiting for, the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior, the rapture of the church, that we would have confidence and, and be not ashamed before him at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to be I don't want to be living in sin. I don't want to be messing around with this world when Jesus comes. And that, that's the warning. He's warning believers here. And there's two groups. There's, there's believers. He warns believers, you know, hey, don't be messing around with this world. You don't want to be ashamed. You don't want to be caught in, in sin or in any of these things. When Jesus comes back, you want to be a pure and a holy bride before him, right? That's who we want to be. We, we want to be, be people that are really saved. You know, in Matthew 25, after the Sermon on the Mount, or, you know, Jesus will continue and he'll exhort about, remember the, the ten virgins, right? You got, in Matthew chapter 25, you got five that have the oil, five that don't, right? You got a bride dressed up for a wedding day, but she ain't a bride, right? He that has the Spirit, you know, you're, you're none of his, Romans chapter 8. Hey, don't, don't be religious and not saved. That's another warning. Right? That's another warning that Jesus will go on to say is that you can be religious and not saved. Matthew chapter 25. You know, don't, don't, don't play games with that. Here, the warning is, man, we don't want to be, be ashamed. And there's a contrast. Listen, there's a contrast here. There's that day, we don't want it to, to catch us unaware, so we need to take heed about these things because here's what's going to happen, verse 35. For as a snare, it will come upon them. See, there, there's us, the believer, and there's them, the world, those that dwell upon the face of the earth, right? When, man, it, it's, it's going to be like a, a trap. It's going to be something unexpected, like a snare, Suddenly, man, it's going to be triggered. And those that are dwelling, those that are living upon this earth, and, and the idea that they're just settled in this world, right? It, it's going to come upon them unaware. That's not you. That's not me, right? That, that's the world, right? But guess what? I don't want to be settled in this world. This comes upon those that are living in this world, those that are unsaved. And man, they, they're settled in this world. You know, as a believer, I'm not settled in this world. I'm not satisfied with this world. I'm not living for this world. I mean, we live in this world. You got to have a job, right? You got to go to work. You got to provide for your family and have a house and do these things and get groceries. You need a car. You need these things to, you know, to function in this world. We're in this world, but we ain't of this world. We don't belong in this world, right? We're not settled in this world. And he, the, the warning that he's giving to the churches, this world, they're settled. This, this is all they've got. But you've got something so much greater in Christ Jesus. You've got so, something so much better. You've got a home eternal in the heavens. But our flesh, man, it, it gets comfortable in this world. And so I need my heart to be set on things above where Christ is. So look at verse 36. He says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch. What do you need to do? Take heed to yourselves. Don't let your heart be dull. Watch and pray. And guess what? Here it is, present imperative again. It's a command. Watch. Be praying. As he's commanding us to, to be watching, to be ready, to be, to be praying continually, to stay alert. I need to stay alert because, you know what, my heart can get lazy. My heart can just, it's the, the natural bent of our heart, the sinful nature is, is, is towards these things. He's saying, you need to be on guard against these things because you don't want the return of Jesus to catch you off guard. That, 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 that you be worthy to escape these things over and over. Watch and pray, watch and pray because judgment is coming. And, and what a wonderful promise that, that we'd be worthy to escape these things. And you think, man, who's, who's worthy? 
who's worthy. You know, it said there at the end of that verse, uh, to stand before the Son of Man. Remember when the judgment of Jesus does come in Revelation chapter 6? And you get at that? And, and they said, the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? In Psalm chapter 1 verse 5, it says that the ungodly, they don't stand in the judgment. They're not part of the congregation of the righteous, Psalm 1, 5. I see the ungodly, they're not going to stand before the Lord. The ungodly, they're not, they're not the part of the, the congregation of the righteous, the, the believer, right? How, how are you worthy? How are you worthy to, to escape? How are you worthy to stand before the Son of Man, to be part of the congregation of the righteous? Well, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you're worthy. They're not worthy because of, of some works or some effort that you've done. Colossians chapter 1, what, this is such an encouraging verse. So Colossians chapter 1, it says that, Colossians 1.20, that having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, by Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, now, yet now he's reconciled. You were an enemy before. You were an enemy of God. You didn't follow God. You might have been religious, but you weren't born again. You didn't turn your life for Jesus. You just lived for what you wanted to live for. We were enemies, but now we've been reconciled. We've been brought back into a right relationship with God. And it says he, he's done this. He's reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Look at this. To present you holy. To present you unblameable to, and, and, and unreprovable in his sight. Holy. You know what the word holy means? It means to be set apart for a special use. That God's, God's got a plan for your life. God set you apart. You're, you're his. The un, unblameable. Can't, nobody can say anything against you. You're like, man, people can say a lot of stuff against me, right? You know, there's a whole list. Here's what's great. Because of the work of Jesus Christ, your sin's been covered. It's been cast away as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more forever. They say, hey, well, he did this. It's covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, and his blood continually cleanses us, right? We walk in the light as he, man, he, you know, he's, he's, his, his sacrifice is sufficient, unreprovable in his sight so that we can stand before him. We can stand before him holy. He's done the work so that we can stand before him and be blameless and be faultless in his sight. You know, and there's, there's a contrast, isn't there? You know, the world, the world like, like Sodom, is facing judgment, is coming upon this, this earth. But, but the believer, believer, we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. And you know, it's so interesting. There's, don't, don't get this idea that, man, there's kind of this like, you got to be the, a holy, holy roller Christian to, to get the rapture, and there's like a rapture purgatory, you know? Like, you ain't, ain't good enough, you ain't going up, right? You read about Lot. Lot's a picture of the rapture of the church. You know, God always delivers the righteous before judgment. It says principle. It's in the Bible. He hasn't appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation, right? You wouldn't know Lot was righteous or just unless Peter told us about it, right? We didn't have Peter telling us about it. We'd be like, dude, that guy, I don't know what God was doing rescuing him, you know? And maybe some people might think that about you and about me, right? But I'm thankful that we're justified. We're made righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's going to deliver you, but he wants to present you faultless. You know, Paul would go on and talk about the work of the ministry, the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word that they're doing, exhorting people because you know what? He wants the church, his desire for the church. And he says it in Colossians, we preach warning, teaching every man in all wisdom that we might present every man perfect in Christ. He labors, he strives. I said, his heart, his desire for the church, right? But, you know, I look at Lot, and you got Lot got delivered, but you know what? I don't want my life to look like that. I, I don't want my life to be like him. I don't, I don't want to be dull. I don't want to be weighed down. I don't want to be tormented by this world. I've been there before. I don't want, I don't want to go back there. That's the most, you know, the most miserable place to be as a Christian is backslidden? That's miserable. Because here's, here's the thing. 
You think, man, I'm going I'm to go after this world. I'm going I'm to give into that. I'm going to do that. And you think, man, that's going to satisfy me. That's going to make me happy. I'm going to go back. And you go to those things, and you know what? You find emptiness. It's fleeting. It comes and sin's pleasurable for a season, but it's not enough, and you're never satisfied. That's how sin, it's still, sin, still, sin, sin, sin still works that way. It worked that way before you got saved. It works that way now, but now you, you feel it even more. Because you know the only thing that can satisfy your heart and your life is, is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, man, I'm not in fellowship. I'm living in these things. And I don't want, and it weighs you down. You become dull. You become hardened to these things. Our, our, our life, you know, he says, little children, abide in him. Abide in him. So we won't be ashamed before him at his coming. What happens when we abide in Christ? You abide in Christ, you take a branch and you connect it to that vine, it's going to produce fruit. But what happens, you know, Jesus says, for without me you can do nothing. But a branch that's not abiding, what happens to it? Well, Jesus says it withers up, it dries up. He's not talking about losing your salvation, right? It, what, what happens is when you're not close to Jesus, you're not connected to the vine, when you're not close to him, your life is going to dry up. You're, it's just going to be going to wither up and be burdened by the things of this life. That, that's what happens. I don't want that. I don't want that for my life. You know, this is a sober warning. You read this, man, what a, what a sober warning to, to this teaching right here because Jesus knows what can happen. He says, go be watching. Be on guard. These things can dull your heart. Don't get stuck in sin. But listen, if you're stuck in sin, let's, let's get out. Let's get out. You come to Jesus. There's victory in Christ Jesus. You confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you. The Bible says cast it off. You don't got to go through some Christian rehab program. Listen, you, you might be a thousand steps away from the Lord. It's one step back to Jesus Christ. His forgiveness, you don't got to go through like, you know, we do, we do this to ourselves because we don't believe the word of God right? We do this to ourselves. You know, he says, confess your sin, right? And he's going to forgive you. He's going to cleanse you. And we think, well, you know, I got to get, I got to get a little bit better. And then once I get a little bit better, then I'm going to show up at church, you know, I'll kind of sit in the back row and I'll move up one row. And every week, maybe if I do better this week, I'll move up a row, you know? And, 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 and then maybe, you know, maybe I can, I can start to, to sing. I'm not going to sing the songs right now. You know, I, gotta, I ain't good enough to sing the songs around here. But now I can start to sing and we think that we've got to do something to make ourselves right with God again. Did you ever do anything to save yourself? You never could do nothing to get right with God. You're right with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's enough. What that tells me, you don't believe God's word and I know it because I've been there. I think I got to do something. I got to earn it. I got to do this. There's no, there's no like, you know, Christian. There's no, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forgive you but you got to wait three weeks. It's automatic. I love it. It's automatic in your life. God wants to do that work. He wants to free you. He wants to set you free to, today. He says, cast off those things and you put, put off. Don't make provision for it. Don't plan on it. Don't make any plans. I'm going to go back to that. Don't go back. You just put it off. You cast it off and you put on Jesus. You let him change your life. You come to Jesus. You let him do the work that he wants to do in you and, and he's going to present you blameless. He's going to present you faultless. He's going to present you holy and set apart for him. That's the work that Jesus can do. That's the work Jesus wants to do in your life. And so he says, take heed. Right? Be on guard. He's encouraging us. Watch your hearts about these things. Watch your heart. Get close to the Lord. Are you ready? Is your heart ready? Maybe, maybe it's not today. Maybe, you know, we're here and you're in a place and you're like, hey, I'm not close to the Lord. Guess what? You can come. You can be close to Jesus today. You can walk in the light and let his blood cleanse you.